conventional soldier. A military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Thank you again for downloading another episode from the Unconventional Soldier podcast, which aims to record the history of the British Army's STA patrols unit through the voices of veterans who serve in its ranks. Today, we're talking, talking to Jimmy Moran, who was in the Parachute Regiment, and he was our chief instructor for the selection course in the late 80s. And he took over from Geordie Watson, who we discussed in an earlier podcast with Ian about the early selection courses. On this episode, we'll discuss the Falklands War in 1982, known as Op Corporate, on which Jimmy deployed with Free Para. We'll also talk about the lessons he learned during this campaign, how this influenced his thoughts on training, and how he used this knowledge to make the selection and training for the battery more realistic. Finally, we'll finish off with Desert Island Dits, as you know. It'll be Jimmy's choice of book film and luxury item and Colin and I will obviously throw a couple of ideas in as well. So as usual we'll start off with our guest backstory and how he ended up from the parachute regiment to an obscure artillery regiment in the British Army of the Rhine. So Jimmy please tell me your story. Evening guys I joined the regiment uh, in 1972 as a, a boy soldier. My father had served in both the Royal Scots and the parachute regiment so basically I was, I was an army brat my dad was my hero. I was always going to follow him at the regiment. I was not interested whatsoever uh, in any other military formation. It had to be the Paris. So at 15, uh, as you could in those days, I joined the Junior Parachute Company, served in that for two years. And then very shortly after my 17th birthday, I joined recruit company at the Paris Depot. I went through the basic recruit training, passing out in June of 74. I was posted to Free Para, who at that time were in Northern Ireland. I was too young to deploy, so I stayed on rear party until they returned some weeks later. On their arrival, I joined a company of Free Para and spent the bulk of my army service with the 3rd Battalion. However, I did serve in the other two parachute battalions as well, particularly two Para, where I spent my last six years of uh, my 22 year service. Did your dad join up during the war or was, he, was that after the war he joined up? Now, my dad did national service in the Royal Scots and then signed on as a regular. Uh, and it was while he was in Suez that he saw the Parachute Regiment in action, decided that was for him. Uh, and he then did P Company and transferred. And again, he joined Free Power himself. Was he a 22-year career man like yourself? Yes, he, he was. Yeah, he did the full 22 as well. A lot of pressure on you during training there then, mate, and P Company <laughs> and your dad hanging over you like that. I, I tell you what, it was a nightmare. I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy. But I, I, when I was a, a recruit instructor later on in life, uh, I did feel for the lads who I took through the depot, uh, whose fathers were in the regiment. I, I knew the, the strains and the stresses that they were under trying to follow in their dad's footsteps. It's not easy. Coming up to uh, a brief outline of the Power Battalion all that? Yes, a brief outline of the, the composition or the order of battle uh, of a parachute battalion. This will assist us later on when we start talking about the Falklands. Uh, it will give people a better understanding of, of who is what out on the ground. Uh, very simply, there's three rifle companies in a parachute battalion. In free para, very simply, they're A, B and C company. They are the, uh, the mailed fist of the parachute regiment. These are the guys that turn up uh, and basically close up the enemy and kill them. Everybody else in the battalion is there to support those three units arriving on the target. So three rifle companies. You then have a patrol company. Uh, this is where we start differing now from a, a normal infantry or bat. Our patrol companies were started in the early 60s during the Borneo campaign. And they were raised by the free parachute battalions to support the SAS operations during that Borneo campaign. So they were trained by the SAS. There were four-man patrols, something like uh, seven or eight to each company. And the battalions kept those patrol companies going after the Borneo campaign was finished. So all three battalions, one, two, and three para had a patrol company. In free para, it was D Company. We then have our support company, which is the heavy weapons company. That's the 81 millimeter mortar, the general purpose machine gun in the sustained fire roll, and the anti-tank platoon. At that time, we had two weapon systems, the Milan anti-tank uh, guided missile and the 120 millimeter Wombat anti-tank gun. Milan was new, and we were just starting to train guys on it when the war happened. 
and the 120 millimeter gun is an old weapon system, outdated. We took it to the Falklands. It was prepared for battle, but never left the ships. It was left alone. Those of us who were uh, anti-tank gunners, uh, we then re-rolled and became mini fire support teams using the GPMG. More about that later on. So that's the support company. Each of those three rifle companies will get its own detachment on an operation of machine gun platoon, the anti-tank platoon, and its mortars to form then that company fighting group. I was always attached to B Company. That was my company. From there, you've got your standard HQ company, which is your cooks, bottle washers, uh, signals platoon, and the like. Uh, our snipers within the battalion were dispersed through the uh, patrol company call signs. Again, more about them later on. So that simply is the composition of a battalion. Uh, that is how we deployed to the Falklands. And given a few small minor shakedowns to fit the operation, that is how we deployed out on the ground uh, when we landed in May 1982 on East Falkland. Did you have Milan on the ground out there, Jimmy, as well? Yes, yes, we did. We're actually, uh, I should mention that the, the, the time that all this kicked off, we were running a, a support weapons card at the time, and I was actually teaching the 120mm gun. Uh, Milan, we've just been given it, along with the Klansman radio system. So we're running a card, uh, basically teach guys from scratch. Uh, Milan, it, it was nothing to do with me. Uh, I was totally gun. But uh, yeah, we deployed it on the ground during the campaign. And again, I'll, I'll discuss that when we go on to the, uh, the battle for Mount Longdon. It, it's a good bit of kit, and, and it remained a, a good bit of kit during its surface. Uh, we never used it really in the anti-tank role in Power Edge. We always used it for destroying bunkers and stuff like that. Great bit of kit. So what roles then, Jimmy, um, did you sort of fulfill during your period with the battalion? You will always start off in a, in a rifle company. That's where, you, where you're going to cut your teeth. Uh, and you're expected to spend at least three years in a rifle company learning the, the basics, basically being a, a parachute soldier. Uh, it, it's hard and fast. Almost on joining Free Para, the Turks attacked and invaded Cyprus, and we were immediately put on standby to go over there, obviously deployed to the sovereign bases to prevent the Turks uh, having incursions upon our sovereign territory. So it's very hard and fast. It, it, it was basically keep up or get out. It was simple as that. You, you lived or died by your reputation uh, and your personal skills. So three years in a rifle company. From there, you'd be looking at an attachment at some stage of the game for a couple of years to either support company or patrol company. For myself, I served in every single company in free para apart from C in HQ. And that's probably standard for anybody in a 22-year career in the regiment. You will bounce around the companies, you will move on promotion, you move on skill change, uh, but ultimately it's, it's all about those free rifle companies. I loved rifle company work. That and patrolling, they were my babies and that's all I wanted to do. I enjoyed the anti-tank side of it, but, but I was always, it, it was rifle company for me. I was very lucky. I had a standard career, if you like. I was a section commander in a rifle company, a deck commander in support company, platoon sergeant in a rifle company, platoon commander in support company. I was very lucky to get that as a color sergeant I was at the time. It, it, obviously, it's usually captains that command platoons in support company, but I commanded uh, one of the platoons there for uh, a year and a half as a, a color sergeant, and that was great. Two para, I did the same sort of jobs. Uh, finished up as a W02, and again, I was a platoon commander in two para when I hung up my boots. A couple of attachments away from the battalion, first one being at the depot, I trained recruits for two years just after the Falklands. And of course, from September 89 to, I think, September 91, I was with the special OP troop in five regiment and obviously uh, four sim free batteries. It became halfway through my, uh, my tour with five reg. So all in all, a, a pretty full career. Uh, I died with my boots on, which is exactly what I wanted to do. I spent all my life trying to avoid being a, a CQMS. And <laughs> to, to a degree, I achieved it. I couldn't, couldn't quite escape it in the end. Two para got me. Uh, but luckily, I was promoted to warrant officer quite quickly in two para. And I, I had my own platoon, and that was just fantastic. And what operational tours did you do during your time, Jim? Uh, right, okay, Op Banner, uh, 1970s. It was all about Op Banner. You were either in there, just back, or you were training to go. So Op Banner, obviously corporate with Free Para in the Falklands. Uh, Granby with uh, 473 Battery. 
And then Telic 1, uh, I was daft enough to join a bloody TA airborne unit when I got out. <laughs> I never knew and, that. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So I found myself moving from Algeria to uh, Kuwait uh, in support of uh, 1 and 3 para as a civvy. Uh, did you get mobilised or did, uh, did, did you volunteer to go? Uh, I was mobilised. There was no way, there was no way I was volunteering. I actually came back on leave from Algeria. Uh, and the wife said there was a big brown envelope just arrived. I knew exactly what it was. Yeah. And uh, about a week later, I was at Chilwell getting the old fighting gear back on. I think that was a shock to the system, man. Yep. Next minute on the start line in Kuwait, went to go back over the border into Iraq again. <laughs> what was your role on Telic 1 then, Jimmy? I joined 144 Parachute Medical Squadron. Okay. Which was the reserve squadron of 23 PFA yeah. uh, Parachute Field Ambulance, our regular paramedical squadron so we deployed with them basically or 16 air assault close medical support regiment as it became then and basically i was uh, in support of one and free para throughout the entire operation can't keep a good man down jimmy i'm laughing at that one <laughs> 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 okay so we'll move on to the the meat of the matter now and we'll we'll cover a bit about the history of the invasion of the falklands first because i think for people of my age and Kev's age, we joined just after the Falklands, and it's hard to emphasize how much the Falklands influenced us and the army at the time as soldiers. Mm. So for guys like yourself, Jimmy, you know, if you, you told us you were in the Falklands, it was one of those bloody hell, you know, I mean, somebody who, who went through that, you know, all these guys were held up in very high esteem. So I just want to cover a few facts about the Falklands War, uh, just to prepare the audience who might not be as aware of it. Even though it's worthy of a podcast on its own, I think just this will help set the scene. So it came amidst the backdrop of national decline and large military cuts. And indeed, the Falklands War saved elements of the Royal Marines and elements of the army from being binned because they, were, they proved the use in the Falklands. The conflict lasted 10 weeks and began on the 2nd of April when Argentina invaded and occupied the Falkland Islands. And this was followed shortly after by the invasion of South Georgia the next day. Uh, an interesting point to note is that war was never declared, and that is why it's often referred to as the Falklands Conflict. Shortly after the invasion, the British government dispatched a naval task force to engage the Argentine Navy and Air Force before making an amphibious assault on the islands. And this was an amazing feat involving the requisitioning of ships such as the line of the QA2 and North Sea ferries, a huge feat of logistics. And it is taking the mickey a little bit, but often it's that saying that... Uh, Professionals talk about logistics, amateurs talk tactics, but uh, it's a huge feat of logistics. And if you go on YouTube, there's a whole host of little documentaries there about how they achieved this. Another thing that's quite unique with the Falklands now is that it's closer to World War II then than we are closer to the Falklands now. Mm. And all three service chiefs have served in World War II. And it's probable that a number of the CSMs in the battalion at the time were trained and maybe served with World War II veterans in the early stages of their careers. Like World War II, it was fought on air, land and sea, with losses across the complete battle space. And unlike Afghanistan and Iraq, the belligerents were easily identified and civilians were few and far between. So it was very much like a World War II conflict. It's probably fair to say that the Falklands would never take place again today for a wide variety of reasons, including political will and risk aversion. And we probably don't have the capability, to be honest. I think it's probably worth just outlining. Jimmy talked earlier on about the makeup of a para battalion. I just want to outline quickly the broad outline of the task force of the army that was sent down there. So it consisted of two brigades, three commando brigade, which were 40, 4-2 and 4-5 commando, and they were backfilled by 2 and 3 para. There was support and artillery from 2-9 commando regiment Royal Artillery which was 7879 and 148 battery who did the naval gunfire observation. And there was also 29 battery from 4th Field Regiment Royal Artillery. There was integral air, air defence from the Royal Marines and obviously the usual attached arms, Royal Engineers, etc. 3 Commando Brigade was followed on by 5 Infantry Brigade, which consisted of 1st Battalion Gurkha Rifles, 1 Welsh Guards and 2 Scots Guards and support and artillery from 2-9 Battery 4th Field Regiment RA and other support and elements from 12 Air Defence Regiment Royal Artillery. The opposition then on the Argentinian side consisted of over 10,000 soldiers and airmen and sailors. The army was a mixture of professional soldiers and conscripts. 
Now, military doctor normally dictates that an attacking force should be in the ratio of three to one, i.e. three attackers to every one defender. So in these terms, the task force was outnumbered, and though part of the Argentinian land component was conscripted, they were just as well equipped as the UK, and in some cases, had better clothing and boots. They also had more powerful artillery. They had 155mm guns, 50 caliber machine guns, better night vision devices, and of course, time to prepare defensive positions. I think it's fair to say as well, because there's been some controversy about people could always mention that the Argentines were conscripts, but the majority of forces around the world that anyone fights are conscripts and some of them do bloody well so i think sometimes they, they underestimate that they they downplay their skill set well actually most of the people are going to fight very few armies are just small professional armies and i think they, they underestimate the uh, capability of a conscript sometimes seems about the conscript army in, in the second world war and we smashed it as well yeah absolutely mate totally so the other elements of the Argentinians, the Argentinian Air Force, which was professional with aggressive pilots that pressed home the attacks, allowed them to sink seven British ships, including two frigates and two destroyers. They also sank the Atlantic Conveyor, which had a huge impact on the campaign as it led to the loss of six Wessex and five Chinook helicopters. And Jimmy will cover a bit more about that later on, about the impact that had on him. The Argentinian Navy pretty much sacked it and returned to port following the sinking of the battleship Belgrano by HMS Conqueror and a loss of over 300 sailors. And that was quite important for the campaign as well because uh, that reduced the time the Argentinian Air Force could spend over the islands. So the conflict lasted 74 days and ended with an Argentinian surrender on the 14th of June, returning the British islands to, con to the UK's control. And in total, 649 Argentine military personnel died, and there was 255 British military deaths. And sadly, three Fulton Islanders were also killed. So the end state was that Argentina's military dictatorship government was severely discredited, and civilian rule was restored to Argentina in 1983. And then the UK, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher converted widespread patriotic support into a landslide victory for the Conservative Party, in the parliamentary election of 1983 as well. So, Jimmy, what was your role in the battalion at the time? And was your battalion on spearhead or any other standby at the time? Because you mentioned you were wearing a carder. We were stationed uh, in Tidworth, just outside the uh, Salisbury Plain training area. At that time, we were conducting a support weapons carder. Uh, so we had new guys, basically, from the rifle companies who wanted to transfer into the anti-tanks, uh, mortars or the machine guns. And we were about halfway through those carders when the word of the invasion came through. We continued to train the guys on the carders. The rest of the battalion basically just got themselves geared up, uh, ready to deploy down to the, the docks and sail. More about that in a minute. We were the spearhead battalion uh, for the army at that time. And we were also the lead parachute battalion group. Uh, as today, there's always one para battalion on notice to move all the time. Two para were our reserve battalion. Uh, for a parachute follow-up, and they were on five days' notice to move. So basically, both three and two para were ready to rock right from the word go. And do you think, um, you know, we've, we've all seen in the army where people have been at notice to move, and, and sometimes it's a bit of a bluff, but do you feel, Jimmy, that at that time that the training you guys had carried out and, and being on that five days' notice to move, you were genuinely ready to go at that time? A hundred percent. You know, but being a, an airborne formation, they, they, this is our bread and butter. It has been operationally ready to deploy at very, very short notice. And we've done that over the years and still continue to do so. We're equipped and trained to do that. Unfortunately, unlike five brigade who weren't, and it was to their cost later on when they were actually uh, arrived on the island. Uh, so yeah, yeah, we were up for it. We were ready. And as soon as we give notification that this is going to happen, uh, we get up ready to go to the, uh, got the docks and deploy with the amphibious force. And were you able to carry out any sort of pre-deployment training or was there just not enough time? No, there wasn't any time. We'd been very lucky uh, in the, the year before we'd carried out as a battalion some really, really intense live firing exercises uh, up to company level with support arms. So we were very, very well exercised. Just no time to do any further training. And to be honest, I, I don't think it was required. All we then needed at a later date was refresher training. And again, when I come on to the, the sailing phase down south, I'll, I'll cover a little bit of the training. So no, no mobile phones back then, mate. How did they get everybody back to camp? 
Apparently, one of the companies was on leave. I've got no recollection of that whatsoever, and we certainly weren't. But I know they phoned up all the major uh, railway stations in London, uh, <laughs> and, and they put up a notice basically saying, if you're free para, get yourself back to Tedworth now. <laughs> and guys who were deploying on leave got word, and, and to a man, they all came back quite quickly. Amazing. Don't worry, they're going to be left out, no doubt. Free mobile days. <laughs> so we just, we just started talking about the journey south. So give us an idea about the journey south, what sort of training you, you did going down, and what type of briefings did you receive? Right, okay. Uh, quick order of events. The invasion was on the 2nd of April. The carrier group departed on the 5th. Absolutely outstanding uh, getting that together and deploying in that kind of timeline. We sailed on the Canberra on the 9th of April. Again, damn good effort by the Royal Navy uh, and the, the Merchant Marine uh, in getting that vessel turned from being uh, basically a cruise liner into what became an assault ship. So we sailed on the on the 9th. There was us and two commando units, if I remember rightly, on board the vessel. So it's quite packed uh, and supporting arms as well. We're building two helicopter decks, one forward and one rear. And that construction stayed in place until at least Ascension. So basically, the ship was getting worked on for the whole time we were going down south, at least as far as Ascension. For ourselves, scant information at that stage uh, on Argentinian forces, whether it be Army, Navy, Air Force. And I think somebody just grabbed a, a copy of the Jane's volume uh, for that year and, and perused the pages which had Argentina's forces in it. So very, very little uh, information at all until we got some back briefs from the Marine unit that had been in place on the island when it was attacked. Those lads were on board the Canberra with us, uh, and certainly some of their senior NCOs and officers were. And we started to get information trickling down from those guys as to what that invasion force at that time consisted of. It was all quite daunting, uh, as you can imagine. We were just basically a light infantry unit, ourselves and the commandos, heading down to uh, basically retake the Falkland Islands, free the people, and we're going to be fighting a country which had a very viable navy, an excellent air force, and a half-decent army. Did you um feel, was there a sort of, before you sort of got to the Falklands, Jim, and you're heading down there, was there a feeling that the politicians would sort it all out, or were you just focused from the start, right, we're going down there for a, for a, a, a fight? We were under no illusion that, that, that we would end up on the, the islands either way, that we were either going to fight for them or if there was a political so solution, we'd still sail there and garrison the islands during that sort of interim while things were calming down. So for all intents and purposes, as far as we were concerned, we were going down to the Falklands, either to fight or to garrison. And we, 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 were, we were preparing to go to war. It, it, it was simple as that. We weren't really interested in what the politicians were doing. We were getting daily updates, but it, it was it was war, war fighting focus. That's where we were. Oh, I wonder if because we had uh, the leadership was still from the Second World War, their mindset was different to let's say the mindset of the twenty first century uh, senior management or leadership in the armed forces. In the Second World War, they, they were very much akin to right. We're going to make something happen. Let's just do it as we go along, and they made it work. And I'm wondering if that was still the mindset at the top when they were putting together a task force and getting them out the door as quickly as possible because I would fully yeah yeah I would I would fully agree with that oh, all three heads of staff all, all World War 2 yeah veterans as you say an ex Lancaster bomber pilot uh, a submarine and destroyer captain uh, and a guy that had landed on DD yeah you know what what better guys to have at the helm of what was then Britain's biggest war yeah. since Korea yeah yeah and, and they, they had that can-do, we're going to make it work. Once they had the politicians behind them, right, we'll just get some ships, we'll bolt it together, we'll get everyone sailing, and we'll fix it as we go down. I feel like today we'd be a bit slower and we'd have to put other things in place and other equipment. It would take a lot longer to, to roll out the door, I think. Absolutely. I mean, the plan was by no means perfect uh, and, and the odds were massively stacked against us. I, I saw a quote from the United States Navy after the war, uh, that their assessment of a successful reinvasion by the British forces was a military impossibility. Okay, yeah. so, so so for this task force to get put together and deployed in that space of time, yeah. and then and then retake the islands in that space of yeah. time, it was 
an unbelievable yeah. undertaking by all involved, not just Power Edge, everybody that had any influence on the operation whatsoever. It was very, very impressive. Yeah. So what other training then were you doing on board, Jimmy? We very, very quickly sorted ourselves out on board. Space was limited, so it was a case of the commandos booking various rooms, uh, us taking our turn. We had a promenade deck around the vessel, which was exactly a quarter of a mile long, so you can guess what that was used for. <laughs> uh, and we did everything from basic PT up to 10 milers. Uh, that got a bit daft, to be honest. The Marines one day would run around in PT kit, us being paras, the next day we would run around in boots and denims. The Marines next day would run around in assault order. Next day we'd run around with a bergen on. <laughs> they turn up the next day with two bergens and an anchor tucked under their arm. <laughs> Yeah, we were just going to get a rivalry then, Jimmy. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but it, it was great fun. I mean, for all the, the rivalry, uh, there was absolutely no issues, you know, between any of the units uh, on board. And it was a simple case of everybody just trying to do, outdo everybody else. So with regards to training, uh, we basically carried out every refresher training on every subject you could ever carry while on a vessel going to sea. Uh, so basic infantry skills, map reading, Battle first aid and the like. We fired all our platoon weapons over the side of the vessel. We had some very good presentations from the naval gunfire guys. One of the stars of the presentation actually was uh, a young naval radio operator by the name of Larry, who I was to bump <laughs> into some years later on uh, when handed over the uh, role of chief instructor at uh, Four Seven Three Battery. So yes, we we trained and we trained and we trained. You got when you got to Ascension. I think Ascension was Ascension Island uh, was was hugely important to the task force because I understand uh, from my reading that the a lot of ships were loaded as quick as they could, but when they got to Ascension, that was a chance to shake out, sort of reorder the loading on the ships, but also more importantly for you guys, get a chance to do some landing craft drills and, and some other training. So, what did Ascension enable you to do, and how important do you think that was on the actual operation? It, it was invaluable. That was, in essence, our, our logistics echelon. Without that base in the middle of the Atlantic, we'd have really struggled to have done what we did. Everything that we didn't have anyway was flown in there to then be put on vessels later on. Further units were flown into Ascension to then join us at that stage of the game. Uh, and we trained on the island itself. It's a small volcanic rock sitting in the middle of the Atlantic. Very, very hot, uh, tropical con conditions. It allowed us to go onshore and basically fire every weapon system within the battle group. So that was everything from the SLR up to our mortars uh, and uh, 120 millimeter guns and our Milan anti-tank. I don't believe any of the artillery units went ashore and certainly our rifle companies carried out some uh, good tactical 10 milers as well while they were on there. With regards to assault craft landing training, we did it incessantly day after day. for We were there for about five or six days in total, total offshore. So it was loading drills. Uh, we then come on to the beach landings. There was only one beach on Ascension that you, you could carry out the landings on. And the waters were absolutely full of sharks. I've never seen <laughs> many sharks in my life. Nobody, but nobody swims that lives on Ascension Island to stay on the land. <laughs> and you can imagine at night time, the guys were sneaking half their supper up their jumpers up onto the deck and then hoying, you know, bits of meat and all sorts over the side of the ship to uh, <laughs> watch the sharks avert it. However, that was double-edged because come the time that we were actually going to carry out the landing drills, we told the uh, Royal Marine coxswains on no uncertain terms that there was no way they were going to lower that ramp until we were at least halfway up that beach. <laughs> and that's exactly how it went. <laughs> so, yeah. Drills and drills and drills again, so so we could do it basically in our sleep. And again, I think another another big contrast. I mean, we we've got the the, the World War Two sort of piece coming through this again, but it's probably pretty fair to say that battlefield first aid back then probably wasn't that much different towards how it was in World War Two. Is that a fair assessment? Sort of the training you got? Yes, very very simple. Uh, breathing, bleeding, breaks and burns, and that was it. Nothing more than shell dressing. Uh, we didn't use drips and we weren't trained how to use them. It, it was the basics. Control of hemorrhage, gunshot wounds, burns, fractured limbs. 
as simple as that. Well, one point on that, when we're actually in what was going to become the ship's sick bay, being taught our battlefield first aid, we're all sat in big plastic sacks uh, about the size of a 50-gallon old drum. And I'm sat in one of these, and I, I looked in between my legs at the label on top of the uh, the bag, and it said, bags, body, human remains. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that was a great morale reason. For that. <laughs> we're all sat in body bags. <laughs> I think it's... um. I think first aid in the Falklands is very, very a very interesting subject on a, on a number of levels. Firstly, at the sort of the regimental aid post level, and again, Jimmy, you can correct me on this, but I understand a lot of regimental aid posts in the Falklands and was was a, a bit of a hollow in the ground somewhere where the stretcher bearers took the casualties to to the regimental medical officer and the orderlies. So there was nothing fancy. It was a lot of cases just a dip in the ground. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Uh, as I'll explain later on, there was very little covering the Falklands. Uh, when we're actually uh, on Longdon, in amongst the rocks, the RAP came to the bottom of the uh, the feature, just as you described there, tucked itself in a little hollow alongside a uh, large slab of rock and operated from there uh, and providing absolutely invaluable life-saving service to the battalion. Very brave people. Yeah, amazing. You, I think the fitness of the soldiers, the dedication of the, the, the sort of the medical staff, and I, I've read a few accounts as well where the cold weather helped quite a bit, slow yeah. bleeding and, slow, and slow, slow the down. body system yeah. down so that yeah. guys yeah, who maybe have died in a warmer climate were able to survive. Yeah, you're absolutely right there. In those days, it was a case of always banging in a drip as your sort of first action mm-hmm. uh, in an RAP. But because a lot of our guys, my gunner included, were laid out uh, basically shot and bleeding throughout the whole of the night, the, the low temperatures basically just slowed down the bleeding and then just simply cauterized the wound, uh, and they stopped bleeding. Had they had fluids pumped in them, it's, it's pretty likely that that might have kept the bleeding going. All right. So, yeah, it, uh, it caused a bit of a rethink after the campaign. Yeah. With regards to treating gunshot wounds, you know, giving fluids, et cetera, when you're in those cold conditions. Uh, and certainly a lot of our lads were laid out there for a long, long time, many hours uh, with multiple gunshot wounds, uh, mm-hmm. and survived. And they put it down to the slow bleeding due to the low temperatures. Yeah, amazing. And then to survive that, well, one, one of the other things we'll just briefly cover is the what was called the Red and Green Life Machine, which was the field hospital, which was set up by uh, a surgeon, Captain Rick Jolly. Uh, he was responsible for three sort of field hospitals out there, but the Red and Green Life Machine was probably the best known. Um, he was the only serviceman in the Fulton's War to be honoured by both the British and Argentinian sides. And the awards were for his recognition and achievements in managing three frontline field hospitals in which more than a 1,000 casualties, among them 300 Argentinian soldiers and airmen, were treated. Interesting thing about that red and green life machine was every person that went in there wounded survived. Uh, again, absolutely unbelievable. Uh, Jolly was a senior medical officer of 3 Commando Brigade, and he had intended to use the SS Canberra as a floating field hospital. But the ship's vulnerability air attack meant that it needed to be kept 200 miles at sea. So he's given 90 minutes notice to set up his first field hospital, the Red and Green Life Machine, which is a single-storey derelict meat processing plant at Ajax Bay, one of the three British landing sites in the western coast of East, East sorry, western coast of East Falkland. Sadly, Rick Jolly died a few years ago, only at the very comparatively young age of 71. So, Jimmy, covered a bit about the sort of the the prep going down, but for any soldier, the ground and the weather are always dead important. So what was the ground and weather like? Well, South Atlantic, uh, heading into what was going to become their winter, very, very cold, temperatures hovering on or around zero, constant wind, which really was the main issue, rain, sleet, and snow at quite regular intervals. The biggest issue really, I'd say, was the fact that you were wet most of the time. I've been colder on Sunny Beach training area. However, the temperatures combined with the wind and the wet, we were very simply from the day we landed to the day we left, we were damp. Mm. At best, fucking wet most of the time. And that was the weather that we had. There were some lovely days, crystal clear, but still with that constant wind. Most of the time, it was absolutely freezing. Mm. And you, you talked about Sunny Bridge there, Jimmy. And would you say, I mean, I've seen the pictures, but I wouldn't want to make a presumption, but... It does seem very similar to Sydney Bridge without the forestry blocks. Is, is that a fair assessment? In a nutshell, yes. Sydney Bridge, take away all the trees, all the major bushes, and you've got the Falklands. Rolling moorland, peat bogs, 
no trees whatsoever. So very, very little natural cover from the elements. But an, uh, ideal, an ideal ground that parachute battalions had already trained on, in, in essence. Is that a fair assessment? And the commandos as well, obviously, with their, you know, their, their Arctic history. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, combined with frequent rivers to cross, none of them too deep, thankfully, at, that, uh, at those crossing points. Very small mountains, uh, very rock-strewn mountains they were. And we had a, a geological anomaly called rock runs running down from some of these features. And that's like a, a boulder field. And you'd have boulders the size of a football up to the size of a car, basically strewn in your path at varying depths. And they were that bad that they actually held up uh, one of the commando attacks during our brigade attack on the night of the 11th, 12th of June. That's how bad these things were. So we're crossing them in the pitch dark. And they were obviously ankle breakers of the highest order. So that's the kind of ground that we had to, to cross. Very heavily weighed down, obviously, with equipment. So trying to maintain an upright stance when you're standing on very wet, spongy ground is very, very difficult and very, very energy sapping. And you would freak a lot of people to lower limb injuries. We, we didn't. There was a couple, but not very many at all. Trench foot was the issue. So it was called weather injuries, basically. We were from day one wet. Our, our boots were wet and never dried. Therefore, obviously, your feet are totally damp day and night. Even when you dried them, uh, and, and if you haven't had a sleeping bag, which is infrequent, it got into your bag. You know, you put your dry socks on, but again, putting your dry socks away the following day into your smock, they would end up damp as well. So there, there was no break for your feet. Yeah. And for any civilians less than feet, of one, <laughs> a very basic thing like your feet, if you get something like trench foot, it can make your life an absolute misery. Yeah, well, we all had it to, to varying degrees, uh, some worse than others, and some guys did fall out with trench foot. It's one of those things that it does get bad. It's very, very painful, but you've, you've just got to hack it. It's, it's as simple as that. And most guys did. Looking at, um, I mean, Colin mentioned it about the equipment that the Argentinian forces had and, and the all bats for the British. Looking at the kit, what we get today in the 21st century, the soldiers in Afghan and Iraq, I mean, it's got some tremendous kit. What was the kit like in for that campaign? You know, you could talk about the commandos and the, the parachute regiment being light, you know, light infantry and probably had some of the best kit that the Green Army could possibly have. Tell me something about the kit. I'll tell you what, I wish that statement was true. I <laughs> 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 you shot down, Kev. <laughs> yeah, smokes. Yeah, yeah we, we did. The, the only thing that really that really was different to, to what anybody else in the British Army was issued was our parachute helmet, our parachute smock, uh, and our SAS para Bergens. The rest of our equipment was really pretty much uh, bog standard to what the rest of the British Army was wearing, whether we're back in the UK or on the plains of northern Germany. So it was uh, a para smock, a KF shirt, which was a leftover from World War II, a heavy duty woolen jumper, an Arctic string vest, would you believe that we were issued? <laughs> Did you wear one, Jim? All the time. <laughs> yep. We also got issued Arctic long johns. We wore the standard denims. Putties around our ankles, again, another World War and Ball one bully left over, uh, and the infamous DMS boot on our feet. Could you describe the really... DMS boot, Jimmy? Because I think if there's any civilians listening or, pe or people a good bit younger than us, maybe just describe why the DMS boot contributed <laughs> so much to the trench foot problem. <laughs> right, the, the DMS boot was a very short ankle boot. It was not waterproof in any shape or form, and once it got wet, it stayed wet. So it provided very little ankle support and very little waterproofing, which obviously in an environment like the South Atlantic was vital. As a result of that, as I said earlier, the feet stayed wet. Other than that, it was a great boot. I'd, I'd worn it in the jungle and worn it in the desert. Fine. But for these Arctic conditions in a wet, boggy environment, they were, they were the death knell to a lot of guys' feet. I think across the, the task force, uh, there, was, there was something like 150 guys fell out with uh, lower limb injuries, sorry, with cold weather injuries relating to the footwear. So yeah. that was our basic equipment. On the way down at Ascension, we received the Arctic Warfare jackets and trousers from the resident Arctic Warfare Battalion back in the UK. Mm. I, f I think they gave us every bit of knackered kit that they had. Because <laughs> <laughs> these, these much-loaded 
Arctic warfare smocks, when you held them up to the light, you can actually see the sky through them. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, they, they were that thin and that worn, and the trousers were exactly the same. So the guys wore a mixture, really, of the temperate climate UK stuff, standard denims, Paris smock, or a mix of windproof jacket, windproof trousers. And I think it's probably fair to say, Jimmy, that back in 82, I mean, the Army's very well e- equipped nowadays, but even your Civvy Outdoor gear nowadays is, is, is a mega. But there was nothing much you could have privately purchased back then anyway, I don't think. The fleece jackets didn't really exist no, or no. things like that. There was a much private purchaser kit? No, not at all. Uh, those days, Gore-Tex was a German porn mag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> totally unheard of. Waterproofs were of like a, a plastic composite material. It's like wearing a packet of crisps. Yeah, yeah. So n- not only was it noisy, it also retained any body heat. So if you didn't get wet with the rain, you got wet with the sweat. So we very, very rarely used them as well. So yeah, that we didn't get a chance really to go down to town and buy anything Gucci. Uh, I think I bought a pair of gloves uh, and that was it. And that was as good as it got. There was no down jackets, no Gore-Tex jackets, nothing like that. So no, very little private. Uh, but but again, you could have worn what you wanted, to be honest. Some guys did wear barber jackets and the like. Uh, if you had it and it was relatively military, you put it on and nobody was was concerned whatsoever. But on the whole, we were wearing stuff that you would wear in Salisbury Plain or the Northern Plains of Germany. Yeah. And uh, infantry weapons, the small arms that you took and optics, what, what sort of general kit did you have for that? Uh, again, standard issue at the time with a little bit of, bit of difference due to our role. Uh, each infantry section, and you would have three, three platoons in a company and three sections in each platoon. They would have a GPMG. Everybody else would be armed with uh, an SLR. Within the platoon, there would be one 84 millimeter Carl Gustav, which is, is, is like a bazooka. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, anti-tank weapon and very effective at bunker busting. Uh, that was it really at company level. Self-loading rifles. GPMGs and 84 millimeter anti-tank weapons. Support weapons-wise, we had the GPMG and sustained fire roll, a platoon's worth of that. We had six 81 millimeter mortars, and we had, I believe, four Milan posts with as many missiles as the guys could carry, which was a fair few. Those of us who were gun, we carried general purpose machine guns, again, with the potential to turn them into the sustained fire role as well. So weapon systems, pretty standard to an infantry unit. The only difference was we had a machine gun platoon as well as the machine guns that were within the companies. So we were quite GPMG, light machine gun heavy. A lot of weight to carry on top of all your personal kit as well. It was, and we'll come to that in a minute. So uh, weapons-wise, that was just about it. Optics. There were some of the uh, site unit infantry Trilux still around. Uh, and there was a slack handful of those scattered throughout the rifle companies. That's a very simple times four magnification uh, telescopic site, for want of a better description, to keep it simple. We, with regards to night vision, had the individual weapon site, the IWS. It was a first generation mm. Night, night vision optic, and it was almost as large and as heavy as the SLR, uh, and it wasn't very effective in poor light conditions. Unfortunately, when we uh, eventually attacked London, we attacked in poor visibility conditions, and the IWSs didn't didn't perform too fantastic. We also had at uh, support company level one or two night observation devices, NODs, which is like a very large individual weapon site. And that's normally mounted on a tripod uh, and used for controlling direct fire onto targets. And that's exactly how we used it on Longdon, the one that was actually taken up to the top of the mountain. So very, very simple. Uh, And as I'll discuss later on, the optics and weapons issued to the Argentine forces that we were facing were far superior to what we had. So they outnumbered us physically and their weapons were far better. And their night sights were just a a different world altogether to what we were carrying. Usual story for the British Army, that, isn't it? (laughs) I'm afraid so. I'm afraid so. So before we move on to the ground campaign then, Jimmy, I just want to uh, probably just talk a little bit about risk. Because I think the Army's attitude to risk back then was a lot, lot different to it it is now. Uh, And I think we've already touched on that with the three service chiefs having World War II experience. 
But, you know, one thing, listen to your conversation there, no mention of body armour. Uh, and in this day and age, the British Army would not go anywhere without body armour. It's also interesting to see when you read accounts of the Falklands about the decisions taken at battalion level that I doubt would even get off the drawing board now. Now, for example, you might correct me on this, but I believe the Scots Guards uh, attacked Tumbledown with berries on and no helmets because they thought it would aid recognition. Um, That's absolutely right. And can you imagine a battalion commander making that decision now? No. <laughs> no, I don't think there's much chance of that. It'd be straight in the papers and some mum would be complaining somewhere. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And you know, there's a principle that n- normally applies to um, military vehicles. You know, mobility, firepower, or protection, pick any two. So if you pick heavy weapons and protection for the vehicle, you can kiss goodbye to mobility. And you look at what the contemporary soldier carried in Afghanistan if you had had to fight in all that body armour and everything else, Jimmy, would you have? Do you think it would have been impossible? Would you think you'd have been as successful with weighed down with all that body armour and kit that the new that the modern soldier carries? No, I think that would have been detrimental to the assault. Uh, we actually, I didn't myself, but the company that I was with stripped off their webbing and assaulted London in their Paris mocks. Wow! And that's where the the mobility came in. Yeah. We were fighting in the pitch dark in amongst rocks. Mm-hmm. Therefore, body armour and all the other extra bits and bodies the lads carried these days, even chest webbing, uh, I wouldn't have wanted that on me. Uh, you need to better get down when you need to get down. And I think we'd have been like turtles up in those rocks if we'd had to carry that, that kind of kit. Uh, body armour, no way would we have worn that, even if we were, even if we had the offer. Not a chance. We would have left that behind. We needed mobility. One of the lessons I learned is that the longer you're up, the more chances are you're going to get shot. When you're up, you've got to be moving fast. Mm. Just don't give the opposition a, a chance to get more than a couple of rounds off at you. If we'd have been more overloaded than we were, and we were quite, I mean, our smocks weighed pounds and pounds and pounds because our pockets were full of ammo. Uh, but any more weight than that, yeah, that, that would have caused casualties, in, in my belief. Guys would not have been able to move fast enough in close contact with the enemy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting, I mean, it's probably quite controversial, but it's a, certainly a discussion we could go down a rabbit hole on. But you look at what guys have to carry now with all the day sacks and the body armour, and they're like they're like modern day knights on the battle space. It's, you know, no mobility whatsoever. So, Jimmy, can you just talk us through the ground campaign from your perspective leading up to the Argentinian surrender? Okay, I'll, I'll start from the initial beach landing. Uh, for us in Free Power, that was the morning of the 22nd of May. So the, the task force basically anchored up in San Carlos Water, which was uh, to the western side of East Falkland. So basically in Lima Stanley, but at the far side of the island. So two power landed first. Uh, the whole landing was supposed to be in the dark. Uh, for, for many reasons, two powers landing, the timings were extended, which led to us, unfortunately, carrying out our landing assault in, in, in daylight because we were using the same landing craft that Tupara was using. So that was Tupara and two of the commando units in Free Para landing in San Carlos water that morning. We embarked from HMS Intrepid. That was our assault ship, having cross-decked to that from the Canberra, just short of the exclusion zone. Went ashore and basically deployed uh, in the vicinity of the Port San Carlos settlement. We had an enemy OP uh, just north of us on a location called Fanning Head, which basically was a, a, a jutting point of land that came out into the water and dominated the whole of San Carlos water. That was being pummeled by naval gunfire as we got into the assault craft and then headed into the beach. So we've got an engagement going on on our left. We knew there were any enemy forces in Port San Carlos, numbers unknown. As it was, as we were approaching Port San Carlos, they basically left the location and bugged out in the general direction of Stanley. We got all three companies on shore, deployed the rifle companies up onto the high ground above Port San Carlos, myself being with B Company at that time. As I said, I'm a dedicated uh, B Company detachment, and I stayed with B for the entire campaign. So the battalion HQ settled around the settlement itself, which consisted of a farm uh, and a family of about seven or eight. All the rifle companies dug in on the high ground, sitting above Port San Carlos and above the water, and basically dominated our area 
of the beach landing with two para and the commandos just south of us. We'd only, I think, got halfway up the, the feature when we saw our first Picara ground attack aircraft. And that appeared to our south just at the other side of the water and basically tactically flew along a ridge, a ridge line, observing our move up the mountain and obviously the disembarkation of the troops onto the landing areas. So the pilot skimmed along the ridge line, got a look at the landing and then basically disappeared over the other side of the ridge and went back to report to uh, the forces in Stanley itself. So the, the game was up at that stage of the game. And we expected and did receive uh, the Argentinian Air Force arriving in the sound about an hour or so later. By that time, thankfully, we'd got up to the rocks and we, we dug ourselves in. The water table is very high in the Falklands. Uh, a lot of the guys hit water straight away. So it's a case of building up as opposed to digging down. So it's cutting the the turf from the peat and building uh, a sanger, which basically is uh, an improvised bunker made of either rock uh, or compacted earth soil turf. And that's how we basically dug ourselves in to those defensive positions. We dug down in a simple fire trench, six foot by four, or we built a sanger using the peat and rocks that were available. And we got ourselves in in a couple of hours. It's very easy digging. We then test fired all the mortars, sorted out some defensive fire plans and started tying in all the arcs of fire between the different platoons and different companies of the battalion to cover ourselves and to cover the landing areas. As I said, uh, about mid-afternoon, the Argentinian Air Force turned up, I think there was something like 30 aircraft on the first attack and basically attacked every vessel within Falkland Sound. They were all at anchor at the time, apart from the Royal Navy uh, frigates. And that went on for the next four to five days. Incessant air attacks on the anchored supply ships and on the Royal Navy destroyers and uh, corvettes that were within the sound. They were basically covering the logistical move from the landing ships onto the shore. So it was all the heavy stuff, all the stores needed to support that attack. We were very aware that this was a, a one-shot operation. It was either going to work or we are going to end up stuck in the middle of the South Atlantic with no ammunition, no supplies, and basically dead in the water. Did you witness any of the ships going being sunk by the Argentinian Air Force, Jimmy? Yeah, un unfortunately, we had a grand view uh, of the whole of the water. Uh, it's not something that we wanted to see. Uh, and to be honest, it, it depressed us uh, quite greatly. And uh, yeah, it just enhanced our... Uh, our, our feelings of gratitude to the Navy for, one, getting us there in the first place, and, and two, for staying put and supporting the, logistic, uh, the rest of that logistic resupply coming ashore from all the support vessels that were there. And the Canberra itself was plonked right in the middle of the sound with the Reserve Commando Battalion on it, which I think was 4-2 at the time. So there's a hell of a lot of, of really juicy targets mm. sitting in that sound. And, and literally, as one air attack would finish, half an hour later, there was another one, and that just went on and on and on. We were getting updates from our, our CO daily. He would tab up from the, the farm up to the high ground, basically visit every platoon, every company, and give us an update to what was going on. So we were well aware of what ships were hit, what ships had unexploded bombs on, which was something like, I think, eight at one stage of the game. Uh, I think it was either Antelope or Ardent blew up at one o'clock in the morning and literally just lit up the world uh, when that went up. We could see through our binos the holes in the ship's sides of some of the uh, the Navy vessels and the fact that, again, they were staying on station with unexploded bombs on board. It was absolutely unbelievable. But we needed to get going. That, that was the bottom line. But we were witnessing our Navy being sunk. We needed, to, we needed to get going. Okay, and you've already mentioned the Atlantic conveyor, which had the, the air squadron on board, uh, the Chinooks, uh, and I believe uh, some Wessexes. Fortunately, the Harriers that were on board that prior to getting it hit by the Exocet that uh, struck the vessel, they'd already flown off, but the Chinooks less one all went down. So that was our heli mobility out of the window almost immediately. It just left us with what the Navy had brought with them, which is the, the commando uh, air squadron and the naval air squadron guys, and, and that was us. So there was no way there was going to be any significant quantity of troops moved by air that uh, that was totally out of the question 
once the Atlantic conveyor was sunk with that squadron. As terrible as those sinkings were, it could have been a lot worse because you mentioned there, Jimmy, about the sheer quantity of unexploded ordnance. And uh, part of that reason was that the Argentinian armourers were setting the the, the bombs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they had to attack so low. Yeah. They released the bombs too low. Um, testimony to their bravery, but thankfully for us, they were setting the, the bombs wrong. We were very, very lucky in that respect. It, 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 it could have been a disaster. It was a close run thing, as was said after the event. A few more ships going down would have been in trouble. We would have still carried on with the land campaign. There's no way we were going to sit there. We, we'd have still eventually pushed ourselves towards Stanley, but our logistical support, our Navy support, would be gone. Uh, and that would have been an absolute uh, absolute disaster, as it, as it nearly was. It, it was heartbreaking to sit there in our trenches watching these guys getting pummeled day after day after day. Frequently, we would have Argentinian aircraft. Uh, they would engage the ships and then get out of there as fast as they could. The air defences weren't fantastic at that stage of the game. The sea slugs that the Navy used uh, weren't fantastic. Uh, they had buffers, guns on some of the older vessels, again, antiquated. And the rapier system that we took ashore, air defence, again, took, took days to settle in. Uh, and again, didn't, didn't actually knock down too many aircraft from what I could see. I think, again, it goes back to that. But the attitude at the time from the, from the hierarchy was they accepted the losses, which I don't think today would have accepted those losses. We'd, we'd have then sued for peace and looked for a political outcome instead of carrying on with the campaign because the attitude from the senior ranks would have been during the Second World War, they'd lost ships under them. They'd flown in, like you say, bombing raids over Germany. So every time a bombing raid went out, some of the aircraft would not come back and cruise. And so there was a definite acceptance of loss again, versus the success of the campaign. I think today, and Collins already said this, I don't think we have the same attitude politically or at the senior military end because we don't have that experience anymore or that exposure. So you must have been glad, Jimmy, when the breakout and you get out of those trenches and, and, and do something came along. Was that a bit of a relief when that happened? Uh, yes, it was. As I said, it was, it was depressing to sit there and watch the Navy get pummeled day in, day out. Uh, and obviously they were going to sit there for as long as we were around. So we finally broke out uh, from the beachhead. I think it was around about the 28th of May. We started a battalion advance to contact going west, heading east towards Stanley. We, we didn't know where our final destination was going to be. We, we knew ultimately we were going to be attacking Stanley. That was the goal. But we were going to go via various settlements on route and, and conduct it as an advance to contact, depending on what we hit as we went from one end of the island to the other. One of the other commandos uh, followed a similar route, uh, but visiting different settlements on the way. Uh, and two para left its defensive positions and started heading towards Goose Green to attack the uh, strategic reserve of the Argentinians, which was based down at Goose Green itself on the isthmus there. So we've got two para heading down there to attack Goose Green, and you've got uh, one commando unit and three para basically now conducting two advanced contacts across the island to eventually close with the enemy at Stanley. Uh, that's probably physically one of the hardest things I've ever done in my, my 22 years in the army. The ground combined with the conditions and the operational weights that we were carrying, it was just backbending. Absolutely wearisome. Was this just uh, like a battalion snake, Jimmy, was it? Or... Right, the, the, the way we played it, right at the point of the battalion, you would have the, the point company, okay? The point platoon of that company will be in an attack formation. Okay, so first call signs are moving tactically. Behind them, you've then got the rest of the battalion moving in what we call half attack. Very simply, that is the battalion snake. It's B company, one behind the other, off to a flank, C company, one behind the other, and then B doing exactly the same. So tactical at the front, ready to react, depending on what we hit. The rest of the company is basically sitting back in the saddle and tabbing. Out on the flanks and well forward of the battalion, you've got our patrol company. So they are providing flank protection during the move. They're in front of us clearing choke points like river crossing locations. And we would sit outside the settlements until they'd been in and cleared them. And obviously they are the eyes and ears of the battalion. 
So they're out there gathering intelligence as well. Mounting OPs, mobile patrols. More about those guys later on. Their, their, their task over there was very, very demanding. Uh, and they, they had an outstanding role. They, they had a real good war. Uh, so day and night, tabbing. We tabbed during the day, rested maybe every couple of hours for 10 minutes. And we just tabbed and tabbed and tabbed. Distance-wise, it was about 50 miles to our final destination, as it turned out to be, which was Mount Estancia. But obviously, moving tactically, it was far more than 50 miles with many dog legs in between. Light skills, which in effect is our assault order, which is our weapons, our optics, our ammunition, a bit of food, our heavy weapon systems, mortars, Milans, bipods, tripods, barrels, everything being man-packed. So we were literally human mules. And this, unfortunately, is where Fire Brigade got caught out when they landed. Uh, the guys weren't very fit, and they found it impossible to carry operational loads and had to be moved by sea, uh, which led partially to the issue with the attack on the Galahad later on in the campaign. So it, it was where the fitness, basically, of the Pararegg and, and Marines came to the fore. It was moving tactically across broken ground with operational assault loads. So, as I say, this was day and night, basically. Uh, you were stumbling, you were falling into bogs, you were clambering across rock runs, uh, very little breaks. It was freezing cold, so when you stopped, you were thankful to ease the weight off your shoulders, but within five minutes, it was freezing cold again, and you just wanted to move. <laughs> so it was, a, it, was, it was a no-win situation all the time. We had one river crossing on day one, uh, and I'll never forget the, the B Company Sergeant Major. As I got to the far bank, I'm waded through the river. He said to the guys around him, this is going to separate the men from the boys. And, and it did. <laughs> it's exactly what it did. But to their credit, most of the guys completed that tab. So after a couple of days, we arrived outside Till Inlet, uh, which is a small settlement uh, of about, I think, some five or six families. Our patrols went in first, cleared it, and then guided us into the location. We spent one night there, dug in to defend ourselves, and then cracked on with the advance to contact the following day. I did manage to get into a sheep shearing uh, shed for about an hour that, <laughs> that, that night and wrap, wrap myself in some sheepskins. <laughs> well, that five-star luxury that must have been, Jimmy. Well, well, put this with the ticks. thought it was five-star luxury. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were a nightmare. We didn't spend long in there. It, it was just full of ticks. Uh, but it was a welcome break just, just to get out of that incessant wind and cold for half an hour or so. So back on the march again, again, a repetition, day and night tabbing. We then finally arrived outside the settlement of Estancia House, which was a farm uh, on the shoreline, some maybe eight or nine miles away from Stanley. We at this stage had totally outstripped the rest of the brigade. We were on our own. So our colonel was basically told to stop, all right? We'd outstrip the guns, we'd outstrip the ammo, and we'd outstrip the resupply. Bearing in mind all this time, we hadn't had our Bergens either. So, you know, there was no, no sleeping bags to sleep in or anything like that. We were just living out in the open. How many days, Best, you, sorry, Jimmy, how many days had you been without your Bergens at this point, do you reckon? On the actual tab, we didn't have them at all, and we got them after about day six, I believe. Oh, yeah. About day six. We occupied the high ground above Estancia, which is Estancia Mountain and Mount Vernet. So again, Battalion HQ stayed down at the farm complex. All the rifle companies dug in up on the high ground above it. Our patrol platoon established a patrol base halfway in between Mount Estancia and Mount Longdon. Basically looking up to the high ground around Stanley, covering Longdon, Harriet, Two Sisters, and Tumble Down Mountains. They were basically looking at the route that we were going to use to attack Longdon, getting eyes on, and then conducting close target reconnaissance on Longdon itself, once Brigade confirmed that that was going to be our task on the night of the Brigade attack. So as we're digging in, we also mounted fighting patrols to dominate the area around our defensive position. And we also mounted OPs, and I took part in both OPs and the fighting patrols that went out. Uh, we, on one of them, dug in around the Morrill Bridge on the Morrill River, which ran 
in between us and Longdon, with the view that we would then hold that bridge for the battalion to attack Longdon the following day. Bear in mind, we had no artillery, just the ammo that we had on us at the time, and no other support. And our intention was to just go up and attack Longdon. No support from anybody. We moved during the night, forded the Murrow River, took some engineers, our parachute engineers with us. We dug in around the bridge. They cleared the bridge and we just sat there, knowing full well that when it got daylight in the morning, we were going to be in trouble. And we certainly were. The first thing we saw that morning was the Foo Party tabbing up the side of Tumbledown. Then about 20 minutes later, the first rounds started coming down. We were basically registered both forward sections and the rear section and platoon HQ with mortar. And then the 155s came in and 50 cows from Tumbledown. As far as we were concerned, that, that position was untenable at that stage of the game. Told the platoon commander so and left. <laughs> <laughs> We were very, very lucky. Uh, a low-level fog came down, and we used that as cover to withdraw. There was no way we could hold that, sitting out in the open, surrounded by all that high ground uh, and in range of their artillery and, uh, and heavy weapon systems. But that's just an example of one of the fighting patrols that we, uh, we put out. The patrols, in the meantime, daily and nightly, are creeping around Mount Longdon. They got right into the feature. So when it came to our plan of attack, it was based on information that the patrols platoon or company had gathered it was absolutely indispensable we knew there's a minefield around longdon we knew where parts of it were but not the full extent or the depth so it's quite obvious that when we did mount the attack we were going to have to walk through that minefield there, were, there was just no no way around it the power engineers crawled into the minefield dug up some of the mines bought them back so we could get a look at them and they could study them we tried to get the extent of the minefield, but it was just impossible. It was just too long. It basically went around the whole of Longdon in a horseshoe shape. And we were going to walk through the, the centre of that horseshoe eventually. So there was no attempt, Jimmy, to clear lanes or anything. It was just a case of wishful, well, crossing your fingers and home for best. Is that a, is that a fair assessment? That's exactly what it was. Uh, unfortunately, hoping for the best didn't quite work, as we'll go on to later on. But at least we were... We were, we were aware that it was there. I think I'd rather have been not told. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there you go. But no, the, the patrol company's work on Longdon was outstanding. Uh, and a few of the guys got some very high decorations uh, for the work that they carried out. The close target reconnaissance was just outstanding. Uh, we knew the locations of many of the 50 caliber machine guns. We knew where their mortar pits were, sentry positions, the ground radar that they had and the like. Uh, and as I say, those guys were on their bellies and they got right into that position and, and carried out some fantastic work. They also engaged the, the Argentinians now and again just to keep them on their toes. They called in artillery fire once we got it up there. They also brought in some Harrier strikes uh, and they sniped some of the, uh, the sentries as well. Again, just, just, just to keep forcing ourselves upon the enemy all the time. Downside of that, I suppose, is the fact that they knew we were there. But at the same time, they would have been able to easily see us from Longdon while we were dug in around uh, Motor Stanch and Vernet. We'd have, we'd have been in full view. So that's where we were. We came to a halt. The rest of the brigade caught up with us. The battalion echelon at Stancia House at the farm became the, the brigade echelon. So basically everything started to move in around there, ready to support Free Commando Brigade on its attack on the high ground that surrounded Stanley. And the high ground was the key to taking Stanley itself. So that's where we were at that stage of the game. Dug in on those two features, patrolling ahead, dominating the ground, and carrying out close target recce's on Mount Longdon, which had then been confirmed as Free Para's target for the night of the 11th, 12th of June. And that, do you feel then that, I mean, the way you've just described that operation, that's pretty much the bread and butter of your battalion uh, played heavily into the skills set available, would you say as well, Jimmy? Yeah, 100%. This is what we get paid for. So it, it was it was our ballpark, and it, it couldn't really be any better for regards to what a parachute, or, or indeed a commando battalion does. So what was the next stage then? Okay, uh, brigade planning based on our patrolling and the various commando units, CTRs and fighting patrols. From there, they then put a plan together to attack those mountain features that were the gateway to the entry into Stanley. And it was going to be a brigade attack. 
with one parachute battalion, which was three power attacking London, and the two other commando battalions attacking two sisters and Mount Harriet. They were supposed to be two noisy attacks, which is the two commando ones, and ours was going to be silent. And again, the CO had decided that uh, given the British infantry standard of training and night fighting capability and that we were used to fighting at night, we were going to attack London with no prior artillery or naval bombardment preparation. We were going to get as near as we could to the position or indeed onto it before it went kinetic. So we had the guns on standby, but they were on call and free power went in silent. The two Marine battalions were going to go in about half an hour behind us and attack their two locations and go noisy right from the word go. Who's right, who's wrong, I don't know. But I, pref- myself, I would have preferred to have gone noisy. I would, I would have liked that, that location to be prepped because going in silent was double-edged and eventually worked against us to a degree. And again, I'll discuss why later on. That's the end of part one of this podcast. You can continue to listen to the rest of Jimmy's riveting account of Free Paris Battle for Mount Longdon by downloading part two, which will be released a few days after this one. Thanks again to Nick Beale for sponsoring the series and offering technical support through his company ISR. And we'll see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier. Mm-hmm.